Good morning. Um, I also want to um, say thank you to Raymond James and Ron Diner for actually supporting the Lunch Pals program and actually the funder. And Ron is our CEO of the program and he is the driver of telling us all what we need to do. And so if, if you know Ron, he's relentless about getting um, mentors to be matched with our students. And so I, I, I commend him for that effort and I thank you all for um, here this morning very early to this leadership summit. So one of the things you probably thought about when you looked at the invitation, chicken soup for mentoring, what was that all about? I don't know uh, about you all, but we, I grew up where my mom would go into the refrigerator and anything left over, she makes this soup. Does anybody, has anybody ever experienced refrigerator soup? Okay. <laughs> and so it's like, oh, this is left over, this is left over. Let me make this big pot of soup and grilled cheese and it was seven of us seven siblings, including my father, and it was the best soup ever. And you just did not know how she did it. Well, chicken soup for mentoring is the same thing. We're going to try to, she wants me to dance in the middle. So, <laughs> so we're going to give you some exciting, hopefully helpful strategies as you go out as mentors to support our students. So before we get started, I wanna just say it's, meant, it's meaningful interaction means that we're gonna be interacting, we're gonna be moving. I am a speaker that like to get the audience engaged and although it's very early, um, did you hear in my profile I was personal fitness? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so um, the number one, what information is valuable to increase success of a mentoring experience. The second thing we're gonna talk about, what are successful mentoring strategies? And our last uh, bullet, or number three, is it's oftentimes you go to workshops and you get all this information, but how is it applicable to my real life or my workplace? So we're gonna try to crosswalk some of the mentoring components to your workplace. And if you're retired, or if you just, you know, vacationing all over the place, I'll try to connect it to you having fun. <laughs> um, because a lot of us are still working and still got some time. Okay, so I wanted to kind of highlight some pieces, what I call a closer look. It is very important for us to have a mindset of where our students are coming from. And so in order to do that, I wanna just kinda talk about some of these bullets. And I'm sorry if um, I'm, I like to pace. 48% of our families in Pinellas County School is what you call the economically disadvantaged. What that basically means is, as Ron mentioned, over half of our students are in poverty. And that transcends all cultures, all ethnicities. So when you have a school system that now you must not only address all the social issues, but as you move more and more, our families are dealing with economic issues. The other bullet is a staggering piece that when you say 50,000 kids, and of the 50,000, 69% of them are performing at a low proficiency. So you got students that you might interact with, not only deal comes from a, a home of poverty, but now you're also dealing with students that might not be performing academically. The next bullet was very interesting. Um, I attended a workshop more recently that talked about the democracy that's taking place in St. Petersburg. And they indicated the city of St. Petersburg has the highest number of evictions in the state 
and across major countries in the United States. That's huge. Because what that is saying is that the students that you will be interacting with at any given point are homeless. What does homeless mean? If I spent the night at my auntie's house tonight, next week I go to my friend's home, then I go back to my grandmother's home, that student is deemed homeless. Then you have families that are actually living in shelters. So this is an evolving issue that we're constantly dealing with is our homeless population. And right now we have over 34 students in our district that have actually deemed themselves homeless. That's not the ones that are hiding that they're living in their cars. So the second piece, Parents and families are actively disengaging themselves from what we call involvement or engaged family engagement. Why is that important? Because as you know, growing up, you had your parents and your, your father and they all were coming to the school. They were actively involved. But because of the economic issues, they're working two and three jobs they're not able to come to what we call face-to-face -face events where they're engaged. So although I'm talking about the families, I want you to just keep in mind the product of those families, which are the students or the mentees that you will be working with. Families, the family movement is in, um, increasingly becoming fluid. And what does that mean? 68% of Floridians are renters. That to me is also staggering because what that is saying is again, you constantly have this mobility and this movement of children moving at any time. And then my last bullet, the institutional perspective of what is a family is still the two parent home, the nuclear structure, although the dynamics of the families have changed completely. And so although the dynamics have changed, we as educators, the ones in the community or in our corporate sponsors, or all, they're not recognizing or making shifts to adjust to what we're dealing with. So that's very important. The second slide is going to be addressing what I would call the mindset piece. And so when I talk about social class dynamics, I want you to just think about poverty, middle class, and wealth. And this is important. So when you, you go into a mentoring session, you have somewhat of a mindset that could be different from your background experiences. So when you address Families are children in poverty. Time is right now. It's microwavable. Don't tell me anything about, yes, you're in fourth grade, but in six years, you are going to be in high school and you need to prepare for college. Kids in poverty, they want to know what is taking place in my life and impactful to my life right now. When you talk about ed education, it is an abstract. It's not a reality. Because when I go home and I'm dealing with whether we're going to have lights or food on the table, trying to figure out if I'm going to college is not an issue for me. I often say to my girls, who are now adults and having their own family, their kids are the first generation that will not be able to code switch. What do I mean by code switch? As an adult, because I grew up in poverty and I'm pretending to be middle class, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I can crosswalk from middle class mindset to poverty. I can code switch when I need for poverty and I can code switch when I need to be middle class. Where their kids will strictly be middle class mindset. So when you talk about 
going in with your mentees and start talking about this long educational journey, you have to really focus on step one, step two, to make sure they get it because they're in a reality of now. The social emphasis, and this is very important, particularly for kids in poverty, I must like you. If you're my mentee, you gotta, you gotta make me like you. If I like you, oh, I'll love you all the way till I get married, because that's how long you're gonna be with me, right? <laughs> <laughs> the family structure is the matriarch. Even if there's a father in the home, that mother rules the roost, the matriarch. I, he's saying that even in middle class, she rules the, the roost. <laughs> That's why he laughed. <laughs> the driving force is survival and relationship in our environment. And the last piece is possession. What does that mean? And I'm going to give an example. My brother, um, it was seven of us, and we have four doctors in my family. And my brother decide who's now has his doctor degree. He's going to the military. My mom cried for two weeks until my father said, Betty, you have to let that boy go. Why? Because she believed if he left, he will never return. And that is exactly what he did. So poverty people in possession. When you are middle class, it's all about achievement. It is all about achievement. It's all about the future. You could start the day that baby is born. There is a bank account created for money to go in for college. It is a future plan mindset. It is crucial that our education system prepare them to move to the next ladder. And so when you talk about, when you communicating, you have mentees of middle class, acquisition and stability, you have to talk to them about the next level. You have to talk to them, what are your goals and your aspiration? Not that you can't talk to kids in poverty, but the acceptance of that, the driver, is from a foundation of it was built from a family origin. So when you say the patriarch is the ruler, even though it might appear the matriarch runs the house, that patriarch is really the ruler. And so they love acceptance when it's based on achievement. They don't need that goo goo ga, -ga relationship. As long as you're moving me to my next level and they are caught up in things, not people, but possessions of things. And so when you have mentees and you're talking about them, they're going to be, look, how can I gain? When I get a degree, what is it I can do to my degree? Because I must obtain things. Because why is, do I must obtain things? It's going to be a, a signal of my success. And so the last, we don't even deal with the last, because this is generational wealth. There are very few people in our district that have generational wealth. And how we deal with our generational parents and our families, we make sure we have a structure where they are constantly excelling above, the, above all. Not only that, we are putting them on a committee so they can feel that they are in control. So long as you deal with wealth, it's all about post-political and social connections. So think about all of these pieces when you connect with your kids. Any questions thus far on this piece? Okay. So the mentoring soup. Here's the ingredients that we got from the refrigerator. Core values. You have to examine, and we're going to do an activity shortly. You must examine your core beliefs. What is it that I believe? Because whatever you believe, you're going to influence, or you're going to handle, or you're going to discuss with the kids coming from your own core beliefs. <coughs> Listening skills. Mentees will know if you're listening. Oftentimes in our training, we talk about paraphrasing to make sure that they know that you're listening. 
But it is so important that you listen. Commitment. Do not accept this assignment if you're not going to be there. Do not accept this assignment if every other week you're calling in and you're absent. Because these kids look for you every single week. They depend on you. You're the highlight of their day. As Ron Diner said, for five years, he's been a mentor. They look for you. I have high school mentees. I have elementary mentees. And they look for me to be there. So that commitment, a loving and caring disposition. Kids must know that you love and care for them. It goes back to that relationship. And if I like you, they will, they will, um, connect with you. That whole trust piece. Building those strategies so they trust you. And I can tell you once they feel they trust you, they will tell you everything. <laughs> All things. And in the mentor training, we talk about what's confidentiality, what you can, um, you know, some things that you must report to school officials, and that's dealing with child abuse or anything with injury. But most of our sections, uh, sessions with our students, they are confidential. Confidence, building confidence in our kids, self-esteem, that whole relationship piece, the stamina. When you start out with your students and they're just not how you think they should be, because you are dealing with some elementary, and you now elementary are very active. They might want to role play on the floor. You're going to have to get on the floor and role play. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you have to really have stamina to make sure you build that relationship with those students. And the last thing is communication. Um, and I talk about communication and talk about language in the same way I say I can code switch uh, from social class to poverty or middle class. I can also code switch with language. I often say that African Americans are bilingual. <laughs> we are bilingual because most of us in our home language is broken English. So in our home language, if you hear kids that might say, yesterday I went to the stove. Don't look crazy like stove. <laughs> you know, <laughs> stove. All you have to do is, so what I do is say, oh, you went to the store. So, because I know how to do that. They might say, dough, growing up, we went out the dough. No. Don't, the door. So that cold switching of language for all students, you might not get, but don't let them see on your face you're devastated because of their grammar or their English, because some of that stuff will kind of make your eyes pop out your head that you are, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, you try to keep it together. What? <laughs> you know, so you really have to really kind of know that kind of stuff. So. We're going to do a core value belief. You had a piece of paper where you had to fill out um, some responses. I need you, this is part of the interactive, I need you to get up and trade that paper three times. <laughs> Don't put your name over, it shouldn't have been, but trade it about three times to anyone else. Just trade it three, no, not at your table. <laughs> you have to get up. <laughs> Okay, so you're going to respond to the response that you have. So knowing that you, this, this paper in your hand should no longer 
be your original paper. So when I make this statement, I'm going to ask you to either, I was going to say stand up, sit down, but I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. And then we're going to talk about core values. So the first core value, all students dream about what they want to do in their life. How many strongly agree? According to your paper. According to your paper. So I want you, uh, the audience, take a glance that the number of individuals believe that all students have dreams about their life that strongly agree. Okay, thank you. How many agree? Okay, so we have more that agree. That's great. How many strongly disagree? Okay, so we have strongly disagree, one. How many disagree? Okay, so we have a core belief in our room that there's thoughts or beliefs that all students don't have dreams about their life, whether strongly or disagree. And so when you have that mindset or when you have that core belief, is coming from a place where you're evaluating that from the product or the outcome. So when you think about when a child is born or you talk to a kid and a kid has seen something, every kid has something that they want to do in their life. And if you ask that kid, they're going to say something that they've seen, whether they know that to be true. But most of our kids, the majority, all kids, all kids have some level of, I want to do something with my life. But in the journey, it's derailed. And so oftentimes, we shift our core beliefs based on the outcome of the journey, but all students dream about something they want to do in their life. Okay, so the second, all students have the capacity to learn. Why is this important? Because no, you're not going to be tutors, you're not going, but they're going to talk to you about their academics. But so you have to evaluate your core beliefs on, does this student really have the capability to learn? So how many strongly agree that all students have the capacity to learn? Awesome, I like that. How about agree? Okay. Disagree. No, don't, don't fake it now, raise your hand. <laughs> Remember, <laughs> strongly disagree. Okay, so we have two, that all students have the capacity, um, that, that uh, they don't believe all students have the capacity. So I use this example, I don't have water bottles, but if you pick up your coffee cup, your coffee is now at a different level for each cup. But some of you who have not finished your coffee have some level of coffee. So all students, if they have coffee cups or liquid in a bottle, they have some capacity to learn. Whether it's this capacity in my cup, if it's a full bottle in my cup, or have feel. They all have capacity to learn. It is up to us, the ones surrounding, to increase their capacity. But all kids have capacity to learn. So when we go into those places, we have to go with a core belief, no matter what. If my kid comes to me and show me his report card in the straight Fs, I would say, oh my God, this is a beautiful report card. But I want the F's to kind of take a shift. And let me show you what I want them to look like next time. And I'm going to put an A on a piece of paper. And they look, look at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but they all, you have to, uh, you know, you have to do those things. So, so the next one, mentors can change the trajectory of a child's life. Strongly agree. Absolutely. Agree. Disagree, strongly disagree. 
Okay, so you have two. Mentors, the research states that mentors and mentoring is one of the strategies that will completely change a child's life. Completely shift, even if they are coming from homes that are so devastating and they get one caring adult that will see them through, it will change the trajectory of their life. So mentoring and what you're about to embark on is huge, is life changing, is purposeful, is meaningful. When you get up every week and get to that school, you have to know you're making an impact. Even as educators, this is my 35th year in the district. No, yeah, 34. And I, how many of my kids or how many that have ever come back and say, you made a difference in my life. But I know I have about eight students that are not principals in our district. So you can't tell me that I didn't make a difference. And even if they don't ever come back, that's my core belief. <laughs> I'm just that arrogant. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> okay, the last one, the responsibility for encouraging and motivating students rests prim rest, um, primarily on the family and um, parents. Strongly agree. Okay. Agree. And strongly disagree. I mean, dis yeah, and then disagree. Yes. Okay. You ever heard the proverb, it takes a village to raise a child? Yes. Yes, the, the foundation of what we want our kids, it rests primarily with the parent. But guess what? It is going to require every single person in this room. Why? Because the number one thing that impacts us is money. I don't care what you say. Money will upset you. If you wake up and all your money out of the bank, what would you do? What would you do? You wouldn't like that at all, would you? You'd probably go berserk. Yeah. Money impacts us. So if we're not willing to make sure that generation that we think is very young is not productive in society to make our country productive, it's going to eventually impact all of our purses and all of our bank accounts. Never will it not impact us. So we have to make sure if anything else, money should be a motivator, country sustainability should be a motivator, that we must do all we can do to support and help students. I know I don't want to run out of time. So um, key strategies. Here are some of the key strategies that we, uh, in the research, Focus on education skills and relationship. Focus on education. You could talk, you build those relationships and you talk to your students, how was your day? If they say I didn't do well on math, then you know to make a mentor point, you might want to talk to the counselor to see if they can get them a tutor. But that skill, social skills, as adults, we could use some, some some strategies on social skills. And building that relationship, when I say building that relationship, building that relationship of trust, where they come to love you, they believe you're telling them what they need to know. Start by sharing your background experiences. Why? It's important for students to hear a different perspective, a different life. If this is where I live, and this is my community. And I never have ever been out of the city of St. Petersburg. I never, ever have been to a different country. Your background experience gives me Im Im imagery, what I call an image, I'm sorry. An image that I could say, oh my God, is that happening out there? I can really do that. I can get to do those things. So you give them their background. You know, tell them how you grew up. You know, they'll see the difference. Discuss students' interests. This is the thing I think as educators we don't do a great, great job. 
And that's why a lot of our kids are becoming disengaged. We have to base our educational structure on what they want to do and what they're interested in. Because if I'm interested in aerospace, I'm a new grandmother as of June 29th. And each time I pick my little son up, I say, oh, you're an aerospace engineer. <laughs> Hello, you're an aerospace engineer. I'm going to speak. So, so my kids say, mom, what if he doesn't want to be? Oh, no, he's going to be an aerospace engineer. <laughs> I have to speak that over him. And so he, he, as he grow up, he's going to say, Granny, why are you calling me an aerospace engineer? Because you won't carry the basketball or the football, you're going to be an aerospace engineer. <laughs> you know, those things that, you know, the interest, but I'll ask him his interest and then just tell him, but you're going to be an aerospace engineer. <laughs> Goal setting. You want to make sure we have, we're going to have, we talk about activity books, and I know I have to hurry, on goal setting. Kids love to read. If you don't have books, we'll get you books. But start a book club each time, you know, bring a book. They love to hear exciting books. The younger they are, they love to see the pictures. And, and I got one, you know, I always have these stories, but my girls, when they were in high school, I purchased all these large picture books. And every Sunday at 9.30, they didn't tell, of course, their friends. They would come get in my bed, and I would read the picture book. And although they were almost adults, I can remember one picture book was talking about relationships and um, my daughter had just got dumped, you know. So I said to her, oh, you should have read this book before, you know. <laughs> but they learned that relationship with picture books. And so now I have all these picture books for my grandkids. Encourage excellence, affirmation statements. You can do this. You, you know, when kids have low self-esteem, just the point of, if it's a girl, you're so beautiful today, regardless of what they look like. You are so beautiful today. Oh, you're so brilliant. When you make those affirmation statements, kids will eventually believe you, and they will respond to the belief. And discuss inappropriate behaviors. If they come in and they got a referral and they're talking about they did something, discuss those um, behavior pieces. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about controlled impulsiv impulsivity later. I'm sorry. That ties me up. Mentoring concerns. Mentoring unable to, a uh, mentor unable to meet weekly with a mentee. Talk to your community liaison. Tell them this is just a little bit more than I thought so that the kid is not missing a mentor, but you're, you're trying to make sure that you could be there weekly. Again, if your student comes and wants you to be a tutor, just talk to them that you are a pile, and that, but you will talk to the counselor about getting them a tutor for their subject they're struggling in. The student is missing due to absences. You can talk to the counselor. The community liaison should call you so you're not making a trip to the school and the kid is not there. If that is taking place, you need to call Mrs. Simmons and Mrs. Robert right away, or myself, so we can address the school. Um, the mentor is becoming frustrated because they don't know if they're making an impact. Um, we're going to talk about from the activity book some of those, those uh, strategies, that stamina, that you are making an impact, but you have to understand that you might not see it right away. Or a mentor wants to meet beyond the school hours or the kid is trying to persuade them to take you to a baseball game. All of those things are out. You have to stay within the parameter of the school. And the student is too difficult to engage. And so some of those pieces are going to be a little different. So I need two volunteers. Can I get two volunteers? OK, you two over here. If you could come up, can I? Um, so we're going to do a role play. Um, Ms. Simmons and stuff, just a quick role play. Okay, so let me get two chairs. One will be the mentor and one will be the mentee. And I'm going to whisper into your ear what's going to take place. Okay. 
All right, so can I talk to you for a minute over here instead of giving you paper? So you're going to introduce yourself. We're going to be talking. I'm just going to be talking about your background. Um, and then at some point, we're going to introduce a book called Sugar to the Boom Boom. Okay. 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 All right, so can I see you for a second? Okay. So as she talks, you're going to look disengaged. You're going to act like you don't care. But when she mentions a book called Sugar to the Boom Boom, you're going to be super excited. Okay. All right. So I want you to watch and, and try to come up with some things that you observe during this first interaction. Okay, so I'm gonna, let's give them a round of applause. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna ask a couple questions. What was different about her questioning and her response? The enthusiast. Who, she was not enthused at all, was mm -mm. Not enthused at all. I told her not to be. I'm glad I did too. Great acting skills. Okay, so one of the things I want to point out for time, her questions were closed-ended questions. Yeah, that's my story. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it wasn't because you're, you're starting out, but when you ask closed-ended questions, you're not going to engage your mentee. Because she said, do you have a brother? Yes. <laughs> do you like school? Yes. No. You, you, she'll never get her to talk with closed-ended questions. So you have to always think about open-ended questions that's going to create dialogue. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so one of my last pieces before we move into our activity book that we're going to talk about is how mentoring and work strategies are parallel. You will be surprised when you use planning um, goal setting, identifying procedures in the task. And let me just say this, that's a key one. Even in our workplace, those of you who have to do a lot of multitasking and giving a lot of jobs, you have to really take time to say, what is the procedures that I'm going to take to complete the task? Oftentimes, our kids don't really understand Let's pick out what the instructions of the teacher was given to you 
and what is actually the task that you're going to complete. Then you talk about assigning tasks to time. Sometimes at the workplace, it just comes so fast, it's just so convoluted. It's oftentimes you don't get that chance to sit down and say, well, here's what I have to do. Let me assign some time to that. You just have to roll with it. But kids, you can teach kids how to go home, how to say, okay, when I first walk in the door, here's my assignment and my homework. I'm allocating 45 minutes for my homework. You teach them those skills of assigning tasks, identifying quality of the work. That is huge. When you're working at Raymond James and you turn in something that's not quality, you're terminated. That's why corporate world doesn't play. You don't produce, you're, am I correct? You're terminated. <laughs> oh, it, am I? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I'm sorry. If you, if you work for Ron, you will be terminated. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding because he's in the room. <laughs> no, but when you think about educators, you give them, okay, let's try it again. Let's try it again. Let's try it again. And you get to college, and they find out that you are not college ready. You don't have the readiness skills. Somewhere they lacked quality. So we always looking for those quality components. Understanding the key strategies of building relationships. And I think the more and more you talk, the more and more you're gonna build those relationships. And in the corporate world, in any business world, we have to build relationships. But I'm finding out more and more and more adults are becoming more isolated and not really building those relationships, even in the workplace. But you want to build those relationships. Key strategies from control impulsivity. And let me just kind of stop. When you have kids that are impulsive, somebody does something, they strike out and hit you, or they are angry, do you know when you talk about critical thinking skills or being able to walk yourself through that, that part of your brain that works with critical thinking skill is the hippocampus in your frontal lobe. That isn't developed until you're 25. And for men, it isn't developed to their 50. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, it takes men a longer time to, for that part of their brain to develop. So in the interim, we're asking kids, <laughs> You're saying, I know that? <laughs> We're asking kids to problem solve where the brain has not fully developed to do that. So to compensate, you must teach them problem solving skills, critical thinking skills. So if you teach those strategies, and then when they're 25, then it, you know, it, it'll be a lot better than not having those skills. Um, establishing, again, a positive uh, social-emotional atmosphere. And as she mentioned in my, my bio, I was the administrator for five years over employee discipline. And so when you think of five years, that was pretty dark. When you talk about things that people work with children was doing in their private lives. So when you talk about that whole social-emotional atmosphere, it was important for me to build a climate of professionalism. And so in mentoring, you wanna set the atmosphere wherever you're mentoring for a positive interaction and in your workplace. Strategies to help build the generation gap. This is huge. I mean, sometimes I'm willing to connect to the millennials and sometimes I'm saying, I'm not even gonna hire a millennial, you know. <laughs> I mean, because they're not going to stay. They're not going to be loyal to the job. They're going to be following money. You know, all of these things with millennials, you have to know. Now they got Generation X and, and all of this stuff and the social media stuff. Kids will come in at three and can finagle an iPad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just beyond those pieces. Raising the bar, again, setting the expectations 
in organizing the space with stable systems and processes. So right now, I'm going to ask Ms. Roberge and Mrs. Simmons to come up, and we're going to pass out those activities. And Ms. Roberge, I could do it because she's going to kind of go over what's in your booklet. You can get me. Thank you. Oh, do we have it now? We'll get it. about how was it let's go oh my god huh yeah did I If you did not receive a copy, I do apologize. Uh, we did make, please put your name and contact information and we'll make sure you get a copy of that activity sheet booklet. Yeah, so at this time. Just put oh. your name and the school and we'll get it for the new school. So are there any questions at this time? No questions. Okay, so if you have any questions, any information, Please write down that you need to text or email Ron Diner at RaymondJames.com or you can text Mrs. Roberge at 638-2995. And any suggestions or anything or with your experiences that you think we need to address um, immediately, you can you know, put it in the suggestion box and we can get it. So at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to um, Mr. Diner. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.